Coming up next, the Booketing joins forces with Close Reads to closely read and booken Flannery (laughs) O'Connor's Nice. Good country people. Yeah. Everybody, welcome to a very special episode of The Bookening, or is it Close Reads? You'll have to decide. I guess maybe it's a little bit more Bookening because you don't have Angela or Tim, but we do have David Kern, the, the, the you master. Do. You, may, you may regret that choice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I dare say we're honored, aren't we, Brandon? Say what? We're, we're honored. <laughs> we're on it. We're no, all... we're honored we're honored we're honored sorry i'm reading the, the letters of flannery o'connor yes i found a really interesting letter out we'll we'll talk about it in a minute okay great let me just set up what we're doing today my name is nathan Albertson. i'm your humble and obedient host we've got of course jacob menzel the pastor who's master of reading over there and we've what's got what's that i said what's up what's up jake <laughs> and we've hey. got brandon chastine the scholar who's a baller of reading yeah How you i'm doing, right brandon? here nathan good how are you I'm doing. How does one live up to that kind of a nickname? The scholar who's a baller of reading? <laughs> <laughs> you don't, man. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us, we have Mr. David Kern of the Circe Institute of Close Reads, of all kinds of fantastic podcasts out there you can listen to. We'll include links and on the booking side of things, so you can check all that out. But Tell us a little bit about yourself, David. Who are you? What do you do? Why are you on this show? I am the multimedia podcast magazine editor person for the Cersei Institute. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the Close Reads Podcast Network, which has our sort of flagship show. That's where we talk about novels, much like what you guys do. Although we spend more time with specific books than you guys do, from what I can tell. A podcast called The Daily Poem, where every day I read a poem, a couple comments on it. It's like five, six, seven, eight minutes, you know, in that range. Mm-hmm. So you can find that as well. And then we have a bunch of other podcasts as well. And I take care of a lot of that. And I'm the editor of our magazine, which is uh, called Forma, which you can find at formajournal.com if you're interested in that. We have Mystery Story Week coming up next week. So if you are in, into that kind of thing, you can hear about that there. But I don't know. We don't need to talk about that anymore. Let's talk about the stuff we're here to talk about. You want to talk about, you don't want to give any more plugs? What, what is the Cersei Institute? That's what I want to know. Just in case somebody wants to know. Circe Institute, C-I-R-C-E stands for Circe, Circe. Everyone says it differently. Most people say circle. It's <laughs> Center for Independent Research in Classical Education. We do a lot of time researching and um, exploring the ideas that make classical education what it is and how to apply that now. So kind of the intersection of classical thought and contemporary culture, I think, is a good way of thinking about it. We work with a lot of school teachers and a lot of homeschoolers uh, throughout North America and even um, South America and Europe to some degree. So, All right, guys, we're here to talk about Flannery O'Connor. And specifically, the story, a good, no, not a good man, it's hard to find, good country people. Yeah. Brandon, what can you tell us about good country people? You got any context for us? Well, yeah, actually, we can read a little bit of some letters here that she has for us. So we talked about on the context episode, the habit of being. I'm holding it up. The people on the podcast can't actually see this. I'm holding it up (laughs) for David so he can see it. It's her collection of letters, which is fantastic. It was collected by Robert and Sally Fitzgerald. And here we know what's fun about this is you can see various things. You can see, one, the actual historical progression of her career. And then you can also see her thoughts later on as she, as she corresponds with people who are writing and asking her about her stories. So where was this one? I think it's here. I am writing Harcourt Brace to send you an advanced copy of A Good Man is Hard to Find. And it includes a little story called Good Country People as well, which she was very proud of, she says here. Hmm. And this would have been in 1955. So 10 years before her death, well after she had established herself as a short story phenomenon. Is that a fair way to put it? Sure. Well, David, what is your context with Flannery O'Connor? Do you like her? When did you first discover? Tell us the story of David Kern and Flannery (laughs) O'Connor. I know Close Reads has done 
several episodes about her stories and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we I think one of our very first episodes, we actually did the story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, you know, years ago now. Maybe don't go back and listen to that one. I don't think we were doing very good, very well yet. <laughs> um, I discovered Flannery McMahon um, probably in high school sometime mm-hmm. when I probably read her in in a class or something. When I was in college, I really fell in love with her. And interestingly, I fell in love with her work when I was thinking a lot about writing fiction. Hmm. Um, and there was something about the way that she approached telling the story. You know, there's the there's a craftsmanship um, to the way she writes a precision that was appealing to me and that I spent a lot of time trying to imitate poorly. But then there also, you know, as you kind of, there's a, well, in, in a, there's a subtlety to her mm-hmm. that is also not subtle at the same time, if that makes sense. Like she kind of tells you what her stories are about, but then within that framework or within that, uh, the way that she, within the structure, the structural elements that she does that, there's all this subtlety layered underneath it. And that's what appealed to me when I was in college. But I don't think that I really completely got her um, until I started having to, to teach her, not to teach Flannery O'Connor, but to teach Flannery O'Connor to other people. I had to start teaching Flannery O'Connor to high school students and who, you know, they naturally, as most people do upon a first experience with Flannery O'Connor, thought she was strange, shall we say. Mm-hmm. And so when I started having to say, you know, unpack her, unpack what she was doing and try to help people understand, especially high school students who, you know, they maybe liked her for the wrong reasons. I, mean, I wouldn't say the wrong reasons. They liked her for all the weird stuff, the violence, the things that sure. turn a lot of people off. A lot of high school students seem to like, apparently. Mm-hmm. So in figuring out how do you explain this vision of the world that and of writing and of, and of the Christian life that O'Connor had, how do you explain that to high school students? And that's when she really, I think, came, came alive for me. Um, and then we t- did some of the same things on the show. And many of our listeners were um, frustrated by her at first. Really? And, you, know, you spend enough time. Eventually, I think we won people over. When, when you rambling. first read her, were you frustrated by her? Did it take you a while to get into it? Were you put off by the violence? Or did you find it attractive? Or did you have to kind of process it? Or what was your, what was your take on that when you first kind of discovered her and as you got more into her? You're asking me if I found violence attractive? Yeah. Um, <laughs> How does, how do I? <laughs> well, I remember uh, well, reading Good Man is Hard to Find, and I think I just read it in an anthology, and no one had sure, really prepared sure. me for it. And I was a dark emo kind of high school kid, and I just thought yeah. it was cool. I just thought, like, oh, this yeah, is, no. I'm not proud of that, but that is, that is in fact what happened. I think what I liked is how weird it was, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. And I think I liked that it felt like there was a lot going on there, even if I wasn't sure what, what that meant when I was 16 or whatever. I don't know how old I was. Right. She's one of the, f- well, for me, she's one of the few short story writers who when I finish one story, I feel like I have to read the next one. Hmm. Whereas sometimes I get pick up a collection and there's a few people like that, like George Saunders is like that for me. There's a few people like that. But sometimes I'll read a, I'll read a collection of short stories. Like, I don't know, like Carver or someone or Cheever. Like, I like the story, but then I'm not like, oh, I got to go read the next story mm-hmm. in this collection. But O'Connor, for me, it was almost like I was reading a novel where I had to go read the next chapter, even though I knew the next chapter had completely different characters and new, well, mostly new themes and things like that. But she kept me wanting to read. And I think that might have been the weirdness factor. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's fascinating to me because in going back to Flannery O'Connor for the first time in a couple of years, I've discovered that I actually want some space in between each story uh, Hmm. just because they're so powerful and they're almost repetitive in a certain way. Like you always know that there's going to be this terrible person and something terrible is going to happen to him. And I realize that's a very broad generalization but sure she's she's doing a certain sort of thing and it almost for me works better in isolation or even surrounded jake made the comment yesterday when we were talking about it that it would have been really interesting to first discover her stories in the atlantic or in a magazine or something like that you know with recipes yeah. and with other things and then suddenly to read <laughs> a good man is hard to find and just be like oh what just happened to me yeah so i think it's absolutely fascinating that you would you would single her out as and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that i'm just that's that's curious to me that's interesting yeah i i'm like 99 percent sure that that says something more about my weirdness than the story's weird the story's weirdness Mm -hmm. (laughs) 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 but i guess that's why it works for me to keep going back to her you know i go back and i read you know i I haven't read this particular story in a few years there's things that i remembered about it that were really vivid Mm -hmm. uh, that that i didn't that didn't bother me like that I did that I knew it was coming and all that didn't bother me because there's so much other stuff going on there as well. Like every time I read a story of hers, I discover something new. 
Um, and I think that's that's the mark of great literature, and that's the mark of what makes a book or a story or a play or whatever or a poem or whatever it is worth reading really closely. What did you? Well, let's just get into this story. What I, I suppose we all remembered that I think we'd all read this story before. Yep, right, guys. Uh, we all remembered it was the one where the guy steals the leg and ends up <laughs> being a terrible person. Uh, just like every wayfarer and stranger s- tends to do in good old Flannery's uh, stories. <laughs> what was it that stood out to you guys this time? What jumped out? I, I said the obvious thing earlier, so I'm just going to say it again. Uh, it had been a while since I had read this story. That's not the obvious thing. I'll get to the obvious right. thing in a minute. <laughs> it, had been t- <laughs> it had been a while since I had read this story. Um my favorite Flannery O'Connor stories that I go back to are Greenleaf and Judgment Day. And, yeah, those are um, amazing. Yeah, and Revelation, some of the later stories that she would actually be writing on her deathbed. So this one, this one reads well, I think, maybe once or twice in your life. Mm-hmm. But what stood out to me was having read her prayer journals in preparation for context yesterday was how much Holga is Flannery O'Connor. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that's probably the most obvious thing you can say about the story. But in her prayer journals towards the end, have you read her prayer journals or heard it? And um, she talks a lot about the things that you, she talks a lot about lust and these sorts of things that were torturing her towards the end of her studies at Iowa's um, college, the Iowa Institute for the Writers. And so um, seeing that reflected then in Holga and her relationship with this Bible salesman, the illicitness of what was happening came out more than it did the first time I read this story. Mm-hmm. Felt a little bit nastier. In it some did. Ways. And this was the first time I realized what the blue box was when he pulled it out of the Bible. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know if I caught that last time either. Yeah. But I would have been probably in high school when I read this story. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, there was more of that element than I remember being in Flannery O'Connor's stories. And I can't really think of another story that has it that prominently. And for then it to be a story about that's kind of a confessional where this is a PhD student living with her mother in their farmhouse, fairly well off with help. It definitely has overtones of Flannery's life that are interesting. Mm-hmm. So, PhD uh, student who thinks she understands the world and the That's ways right. of the world and is about to get schooled by the country bumpkin. <laughs> yeah, and exactly the sort of insight into the world that some people accuse Flannery of having, that she really didn't have a moral sense. She just thought everybody was bad. Because in her stories, everything is so grotesque and escalated sure that it is hard to see whether or not she thinks anybody is good well let's ex- let's explore that david kern so. true or false flannery o'connor had no moral sense and just thought everyone was bad <laughs> that that flannery o'connor had no moral well i mean so you said that flannery o'connor had no moral sense and thought everyone is bad are those is that what having no moral sense is <laughs> <laughs> okay you got me <laughs> no i mean Come i don't on. That's not really meant to be a gotcha. I mean, I'm, if you're asking me the question, I got to figure out how to answer it. <laughs> Let me ask you a better moment. question. True or false, Flannery O'Connor had a moral sense, and that moral sense was everyone is bad. In other words, she was cynical rather than... Well, um, now, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, you guys might have like some letter queued up mm-hmm. that where she says that. <laughs> but just based on her work, I don't think that she thinks that everyone is inherently bad. I don't know that, and I, I'm making it, I'd have to make a distinction there between maybe like, you know, kind of like the concept of sin nature. I don't, right. I'm not talking right. about that, but I don't think that she, because of her, because her stories are so much about the idea of transformation, I think she thinks that there is within each person, because of the image of God, a capacity for great good that has been distorted. And I, so I think that it's not about, um, whether people are good or evil, it's about, you know, like, what is the disease that is distorting the image of God within us? Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yeah. And I think that there is a very uh, distinct and well-defined moral center at the, the heart of that. And, th- and I think that that is what guides the moral center that is in her work. Now, is there something cynical there, though, in that in order to unlock, in order to transform someone, something brutal almost always has to happen, something so big and so tragic and so transformative. No, nobody ever just has a nice little graceful epiphany in Flannery O'Connor. It's always like something b- really terrible has to happen. I think that, yeah, there might be something cynical in that, um, in that proposition and in the way that that plays itself out in her stories. That's a different question than was Flannery O'Connor cynical. And I don't mean to like 
be twisting your questions at all. I'm no, just thinking no, about it. I'll thinking out loud here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair distinction because somebody can write a cynical s- a story that has a, ho- a hopeful end, a hopeful end, a hopeful design behind it. Mm-hmm. Right. Those are two very different things. Yeah, I think for me, when I'm thinking of this question, because it's a question I ask myself a lot when I'm reading Flannery O'Connor, I remember that essay, The Fiction Writer and His Country, when she talks about her mission was to scream at a world that couldn't hear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. to the deaf, you have to scream. To the blind, you have to draw strange and startling figures. That quote, she saw that as her mission because she did see, um, she didn't think that an artist could just completely take their moral understanding of the world out of their art. Mm-hmm. She thought that if she had a view of the world that was redemptive, that it was redeemed through Christ. She specifically says that in the essay. And then, then that colors her art in the sense that she thinks that she now has to shock people, basically, with the art, with the art she's doing. Because nobody, you either have the people on the one extreme who are, and you see this perfectly, actually, in this story, the two extremes she thought she was talking to. The one extreme would be the people who already thought they were good and were just scandalized by everyone else. So that would be Mrs. Hopewell, Mrs. Goodman. Freeman. Um, Freeman. Freeman, sorry, not Goodman. <laughs> And then on the other extreme, you have the people who think that they're the only ones who have it figured out because they're so educated that they have, they have the world figured out too. She had to scream at both of those parties, she thought. She, no, nobody was off her radar in that sense. Mm-hmm. So she did see her art as having a directive, which I don't think in itself is a cynical directive. Well, Nathan it produces cynicism. Nathan, thing. you used the word escalated, mm-hmm. I think, because her stories are so escalated. I think you said that about five minutes ago. And that, I think that's a good word for what she's trying to do there. That speaks to that idea of screaming, screaming out. So she takes maybe, maybe on the surface, it seems like a cynical approach, but underneath that cynical approach is, I think, a, um, uncyn- an uncynical worldview, so to speak. Sure. Or, yeah. and, and, an, and an uncynical, what's the opposite of cynical? Idealistic? Maybe. Optimistic? Optimistic? There we go. Hopeful? Optimi- hopeful? Hopeful. Okay. Well, yeah. So let's say hopeful, optimistic. There's, you know, there's, there's hope underneath what seems like there's a hopeful core underneath that sort of surface cynicism, I think is one way of thinking about it. If that's her purpose, does she achieve it? Let's talk specifically about this story. Does she achieve it in this story? Oh no. Look, O'Connor is writing. She sees a world full of Southern hypocrisy and she sees a world full of blind glib happy evangelicalism and whatever else. And what she wants to do is startle people awake to see the nature of their own depravity. And so, you know, every story is bent to that in one way or another. And that's an important thing for people to process and to be confronted with. And yeah, she's effective at at accomplishing that in a story. And in this story, I think she doesn't try to get people beyond that. Whether or not she should is another question. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, uh, that's why people love her is because they think, you know, when the high school and the college student that, that is judging their parents, judging their community, judging their, their, the world for the first time, really coming to terms with evil in the world, you know, has Flannery, Flannery O'Connor's stories as a, as a handle um, to process that. That's helpful. Helpful to help them wake up, helpful to help them process, you know, through her grotesques, through her caricatures, the, the sin and depravity in the world and the, and the judgment due. Um, yeah, I found them to be helpful in exactly that way when I was in high school and, and maybe my early 20s. Going back to them in my 30s, it's a little bit different, and I'm not quite sure what to make of them or what utility they have for me. And I'm, I'm not saying that they don't have some. It's just been interesting to try and process, like, what am I supposed to be getting out of this? Was it meant for me even? So I'm interested, David, because you say you've gone back to these stories and they've been resonant. What is it that still speaks to you in them? Well, first of all, there's a level of craftsmanship that I really appreciate still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, absolutely. And I think that... And that's undoubtable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Indubitable. Jake, I think you said that she doesn't go beyond that initial goal that we talked about. And I think that's probably more so true of this collection in general than it is of some of her later work. Yeah, that's totally fair. Agree. That's fair. That's totally fair. And I think that in some ways I can see how that's a limitation on this story and maybe it's how, how much it can mean to us long-term. Well, you know, I don't really know that that is 
even that is true. I think, you know, a short story has to have one point, has to have one epiphany. And she was a master of a very particular kind of epiphany. Maybe it's enough for that to be her thing. It, I, so can I ask, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So what is the thing that, that, okay, I'm, I'm jumping, I'm assuming some things here based on what y'all are saying. Sure. What is the thing that's missing for you? Oh, this? I don't think that there's anything actually missing. What I think is, I, I was just processing how, I think we all just sort of agree to realize that, you know, we were really attracted to O'Connor in high school or first attracted to O'Connor in high school, college. And I was trying to put my finger on what's exactly attractive about that. You know, um, I don't know if I told you this in our interview on Former or not, um, sitting on the back porch, reading Flannery O'Connor stories out loud, reading The River in particular, was really the inspiration for uh, this show, for the book in it. Mm-hmm. That's where it yeah, came you, from. You did mention that, yeah. Yeah. You know, there was a time when I really loved reading Flannery O'Connor stories. So coming back to O'Connor this time, um, just sort of processing how, you know, I wasn't just as in, as into reading these sto- this set of stories as I have been. And I think a lot of that has just been, I'm a pastor. I, more and more and more, the the work that I do is heavier and heavier and dealing with sin and depravity. And to me, that's the kind of thing that at the end of the day, I don't want to get back into in a short story, you know? You know, I live my my life confronted with the realities of sin and depravity in a way that when I was 18, 19, 17, 21, 22, whatever, I was not, it was, it was new, it was different, it felt edgy, it felt like, yeah, she gets it in a way that's like, yeah, I get it. She still Somebody, gets it. Somebody, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I get do it. I still want it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, do I get it? <laughs> Somebody yeah. tell me a story of hope and redemption. That's what I need at the end of this day, you know. Yeah. And so I don't think that that's a fault in the story, though, because I think people need to hear that. I need to preach that, right? Mm-hmm. And I can have sermons that are just trying to hammer home that one point of sin and depravity and judgment. You know, if that's what I feel is necessary, and a short story can do that, and an author can take that on as her apostolate, and and she did, and she and she was a master craftsman at it. Again, just to try to circle back to your question, I don't know that there's anything missing in the stories. I feel like maybe I've changed, hmm. and I don't, and I wouldn't even want to characterize it as um, a flaw or a, a flaw or anything like that. Or what's missing in it for me? It's just like, well. And I don't even, and I don't want to say that I've outgrown Flannery because that sounds so patronizing <laughs> and stupid, right? Like, come on, she's a genius and she, whatever. But I, I think it's just my my place in life, my station in life right now. That's how I've been processing it this go around, at least. And I'm doing a lot of verbal processing right now because <laughs> we had hoped to get through some of this verbal processing last night, and we didn't get to because of how over prepared brandon spent his whole life stuttering flannery o'connor i hope i'm not offending him right now i was just gonna ask so what uh, we got are you are you guys gonna be friends we're gonna be friends yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah i've been trying to process this myself because this is the first time i've come back to flannery in a while i still so and what i've seen reading this volume of stories is that i really like flannery as a person i love her i love the letters they've been fantastic to read those letters i highly recommend everyone reading her letters. They're mm-hmm. great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I would be interested to go back to the her later stories because I think you're right. Two things here. One, the technique of her stories is immaculate, even with these sto- these stories. It's great. She, mm-hmm. We read Dubliners by James Joyce, and I would put any yeah. of these stories up against any of J- Joyce's stories. Except the dead. Except the dead. Except the dead. <laughs> <laughs> Except I Sorry, put, I'm not going to give you that one. <laughs> I would put some of her later stories up against the dead, like Revelation and Judgment Day. Sure. Yeah, maybe. Um, to be fair yeah, to her, she that, died when she, she was young. Yeah. That would actually be a very interesting comparison to do a to do a comparison between one of those late stories and the dead that that could be very yeah. interesting there's going to be a lot of overlap in terms of theme and some of the st- structural elements well if you even though take like so judgment day is a rewriting of geranium which yeah. was her first story that she wrote you can see them in the way that her art would mature geranium was yeah. very it yeah. was closer to the style in the these stories here where you would have a character very comic and then something tragic at the end happens to make you realize that something more than what you expected is happening to this character. Certain of her early critics would 
complain because they would say, well, you're just trying to basically religion they saw for her was her deus ex machina. And so they would complain about that. And so they would say, certain people would say to her, like a good man at hard to find would be perfectly fine if you didn't try to bring Jesus into the end. Like they didn't get it. They didn't understand what she was trying to do there. And for her, it is this moment like Joyce would have. It's the epiphany at the end where you're supposed to just go, be going along with the quotidian day of this person. And then suddenly there's this interference that happens that interrupts their life. And it's supposed to shock both you and the character into some sort of new realization about life. That's the way all her stories work. I, I would say I cannot think of a, an exception to that rule in this collection of stories, just looking through them. Obviously, it's the way the story we've read for today works. Um, Holga has her quotidian hatred of everybody and thinking that she has everything figured out with her Nietzschean nihilism. And then at the end, that's all interrupted by this Bible-selling pervert mm. <laughs> so, who steals her leg. So, <laughs> oh, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> I hate it when that happens, too. And that happens here. But then with her later stories, and I, I brought up a geranium because it's a good example of this, Judgment Day fleshes that out, and there's much more sympathy. I think that that's what you really don't see maybe in these early stories as much that you see with her later stuff is a, is a real actual compassion that was beginning to grow uh, with those stories. Um, Revelation is very similar to some of these early stories in the characters that it deals with. And in fact, there is a character very similar to Holga in that story as they're waiting in this doctor's office. But the revelation that happens is much more sympathetic to these characters than, I would say, some of the things that happen to these characters in these early stories is. That's just mm. me thinking aloud here. So... I was thinking about this story in particular, yep. and I was, I was thinking about who is the character in this story that the sort of customary O'Connor dark grace occurrence happens to? Yep. Like, who, who is the character in the story that has the transformation? Is there one? Is it the one who we expect? Do you, do you guys read this as it being Hol- Holga slash Joy? That's a good question. To me, the easy answer, and I don't know if it's the right one, but the easy answer is the story is somewhat atypical and that there isn't one. It's a rather dour ending. I mean, yeah, she gets to see that other people are even more nihilistic than she is. It's not transformative, perhaps, in the same way that like the grandmother and good man or something like that. Yeah, Greenleaf. I'm that not is sure a whether good I question agree with myself obvi- when I say that. I'm just throwing that out there as the a starting place. First impression. Yeah. You're definitely supposed to think it is going to be Holga. I mean, you have the whole redemption, dark grace moments in the language she uses. I'm trying to find it. Yeah, it was like losing her own life and finding it again miraculously in his. And then that's all just turned on its head. Mm -hmm. How do you read that one with high school students? I I didn't read this one with high school students. I did have a similar experience to you, though, when I taught uh, Flannery O'Connor for the first time to high school students. I actually had a student, after we read A Good Man is Hard to Find, Tell me that she took the book and threw it across the room and screamed. Oh yeah, it, that, I mean that is the appropriate response, though. Yeah, right. That's I mean that's, that is do. that is the appropriate response. If you did, if my students didn't do that, if they didn't throw something, then I assumed they didn't read it. So right. yeah. Well, I was the guy. Oh, I'm so glad they killed that awful family. What a, what a, what a great story! A, I'm glad it had a happy ending. <laughs> she and threw it a brat dog and everything. Yeah. <laughs> It is interesting to note that with a lot of her stories, she will have the epiphany or the dark grace moment happen, and then she'll move on and you'll actually get somebody else's perspective for the last paragraph. Mm -hmm. Just looking through these stories, like Mr. Paradise's head appeared from time to time. That's the river as he's looking for the boy. Mm -hmm. With the good man, it's hard to find, obviously. You know, the famous closing line is not by the grandmother, it's by the misfit. Mm -hmm. The life you save... Maybe your own. That's a little different. I mean, the last line there is with Mr. Shiflet. Well, this story begins, I mean, the, the shifting perspectives is really interesting in this story because yeah. it begins with this thing about the expressions of Mrs. Freeman. Yes. And then it also ends with her expression. And it also it ends with her her commentary on what just happened. We don't even get to Mrs. Hopewell for like 12 lines into the story. Right. And then we don't even meet... I mean, we don't even get inside Joy's head for multiple pages. Yep. So we've got these shifting perspectives, which is both a little bit confounding and intriguing at the same time, I think. Yeah, I did give. I, I was trying to figure out why the story was framed by Mrs. Freeman. One interesting aspect of that is that Flannery O'Connor famously loved, it was open to rewriting and reworking her stories to make them these technical masterpieces that they are. And so there's evidence that the ending to the story, she actually added that after people recommended it to her. 
And so that was uh, just just a, a, a little a good side. So it was going to end was, with Holga. It was going to end with Hol. It was going to end with yeah, Holga just being left with, by this salesman. And someone said, "No, I think that it would be nice to have this book ended. Perspe- book ended. You opened it with Mrs. Freeman, and so it'd be nice to end with her as well." So I was trying to figure out why open with Mrs. Freeman, like the story does, right? I mean, if she me, wasn't intending to bookend it from the start, say what? If she wasn't intending to do that from the beginning, yeah. So what is the what's the point of making Mrs. Freeman and having this long paragraph about Mrs. Freeman's expressions about the fact that she has these two these two expressions that she could wear when she wasn't ha- when she didn't have the neutral one? She had reverse and forward. Mm-hmm. Like, what's the point of this? What's what's going on here? So just building off of your question there, David. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not answering it. I'm just asking <laughs> the same question again. Do you have well, a, but that's what Jake's here David? for. Yeah, Jake's here to answer the question for us. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an answer, David? Do you have thoughts? Well, I have lots of thoughts about the opening. I don't know if I can tell you the answer to that specific question. I, had, I hadn't thought about the question in that sort of framework. But I'm very intrigued by, the, by this idea of Mrs. Freeman being the one who the story opens with. It took me, I reread the first two pages, maybe the first page and a half, a couple times to get my bearings. And I'd forgotten that it begins with Mrs. Freeman. And I, well, actually, yeah. I, what I'd forgotten was that Mrs. Freeman was not Mrs. Hopewell. Yeah. Because initially, the opening line is really fascinating. Besides the neutral expression that she wore when she was alone, Mrs. Freeman had two others, forward and reverse, that she used for all her human dealings. So O'Connor is like giving us this, this motif right out in front, right? Like it's this idea of being two faced. And so she gives us that right away. But then I was thinking, okay, that's Mrs. Hopewell. That's the mother. But then I realized, oh, no, that's actually Mrs. Freeman. So why does she give us this two-faced Mrs. Freeman from the beginning when it feels like it's Mrs. Hope, Mrs. Freeman's the one who's not two-faced to me? She seems like the one who actually... Well, I was just going to say, in some ways, it seems like Mrs. Hopewell in some is sort of two-faced, but Mrs. Freeman is the one who sort of just says it how it is, right? Yeah, and she's good country people. But uh, that actually is an interesting link between her that I haven't had it noticed until just now. That's a link between obviously between her and the Bible salesman as well, because the theme with him is, aren't you just good country people? That's the last thing that Holga says to him is, aren't you just good country people? You know, you're sp- you, all you Christians are the same. You're two-faced. Yeah. And then the fact that then Mrs. Freeman does get the last line, but her very her last line is saying that she could never be like this man who's walking away. <laughs> yeah. And yet yeah. there's all these thematic implications that she is the most linked to him of everyone in the story. Yeah. What do you make of her name? Well... Versus just the comic overtone of the fact that she is in the position of being not the free man. She's the working mm-hmm. servant on this, what, farm? What are we supposed to take this as a farm? Yeah. Farm-ish. <laughs> Farm-ish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is a central relationship that would be in a lot of Flannery O'Connor stories. You had the, with Greenleaf, yep. Greenleaf yeah, yeah. with uh, the relationship there between... The farmers and the tenants, and what's the one where she yeah. lets the tractor run the guy over? The that's the displaced person. The displaced person, yes. <laughs> yeah, literally displaced. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think that yeah, she's not, she's not really free. She's but she's free in the sense that she seems to have the she seems to have this outsized influence on the life of the home. Yeah, she, uh, she does, and also she's free. So there's this sense that Mrs. Hopewell she keeps saying that she thinks that. Well, she's set it up in such a way that she is allowing for Mrs. Freeman to use all of her gifts, right? There's that poor part of the story yeah. where she says, she's the one who's going to direct Mrs. Freeman. And yet there is this sense then that Mrs. Freeman's directing them and playing them. And um, so another link that I just remembered was the fact that Mrs. Freeman, when, she, when we first learned that she's using Holga's name, um, we find out also that Holga doesn't like the expression she has when she looks at her and then she realizes it's just this perverse interest in her leg. And then later, when the Bible salesman looks at her, Holga can't place quite where someone had looked at her that same way before. But I think we're supposed to remember that Mrs. Freeman had looked at her that way. So again, there's this linking between these people where everybody has this one expectation of them and also an expectation of being able to control them. Yeah. Being Mrs. Freeman and being the Bible salesman. Uh, The Bible salesman. Manly Pointer. Manly Pointer, yes. Manly Pointer. That's a very Flannery O'Connor name. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> well, yeah, the names in general with Flannery O'Connor stories are fascinating because in one of these letters she has, she makes the point that none of her stories are actually supposed to be like, they're not supposed to, we're not supposed to think that they are actually a thing that could actually happen, but right. they are, they have a comic overtone, but what's happening beneath them is deadly serious is the way she put it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the names help us see this because they're so, they're like a Dickensian name in the sense that 
<laughs> right. They they make this mm-hmm. almost like a theater as opposed to something we're supposed to think could be happening to us. Mm-hmm. So you have yeah. Hopewell, right? The very mm-hmm. fact that this daughter is named Joy mm-hmm. is supposed to be a joke. I don't want to say it's, I mean, it's not allegorical, but it definitely is supposed to. That's why distan- her name change was her greatest creative achievement. That's right. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to distance you from right. these characters a bit. Yeah. So it can so it can be more uh, acting a bit more like theater then in that mm-hmm. sense. Um, What's interesting though, this is a story I think that's about naming in some ways. And even you even have in the story, someone changing their name. Uh, Joy changes her name, but then also the Bible salesman is constantly changing his name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he yeah. says that at the end, everywhere he goes, you'll never find me because everywhere I go, I change my name. Um, and there's a sort of dishonesty about that. You see it throughout the story. Do characters really know themselves? How self-aware are they really about their limitations, about how they see the world, about their own virtue or lack thereof? Yeah. The one character who sees himself for what he is, is the Bible salesman. He is a, he's a drifter, but he, he's, the, he's, he's fundamentally dishonest with everyone else, which, but he admits that to himself, which makes him probably the most honest character in the story. Right. You know, there's, there's that, that sense of irony, sort of tragic irony, right? That it's tragic because these other characters who think they see the world in the right way, don't, they seem to themselves nor the people around them as they or the other people really are. And the, and the, the transformation is, the question at the end of the story is, has the, are they now seeing people differently than they were at the beginning? And I've often wondered if this is one of those stories where O'Connor is saying, you know, sometimes we're too hard-hearted. Sometimes our own hearts get in the way of the transformation that would otherwise be possible. I'm not saying that's what the story is about, but I sometimes wonder. Although I, I think O'Connor would maybe frustrate with me for trying to overinterpret her work, but... She did well, like to get frustrated with people for that. She did, yeah. One of my favorite... Gosh, I keep going to these letters. I actually have this one marked in purple. The interpretation of your 90 students and three teachers is fantastic and about as far from my attentions as it could get to be. It's one of my favorite lines that she wrote to someone. <laughs> my tone is not meant to be obnoxious. I am in a state of shock. <laughs> so that's probably what she would write to us right now, but hey, it's fun. Um, it's I think nice, she would invite it's, the conversation. It's a nice, it's well, a nice detail. You know, Holga thinks she's going to. Joy is going to uh, redefine herself. Right? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, and and in every possible way that she thinks she's redefined herself, the Bible salesman's got her licked. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. right. Why well, redefine myself every day? Every city I go to, I have a new name. Well, in every possible way. Yep. And so you know, every detail that she includes. This is just good craftsmanship. She includes a lot of details about her. And then she includes nice little, you know, mirrors or uh, callbacks in the Bible salesman. Yep. That just sort of enrich and underline the fact that she she does she she actually doesn't get it. Yeah, she doesn't. But it also can I go down a nerdy do. critical theory mm-hmm. hole here? Heck yeah, uh, man! That's what we pay you the big bucks uh, for. So there's a <laughs> there was a guy who was popular when I went to grad school called Homie K Baba. And he had this essay called, Can the Subalterns Speak? And this is really s- liberal, cruddy, post-colonial theory stuff. But something that I kept thinking, these people seem like what he would call the subaltern. So I need to define what that means. What it is, is it's with the Bible salesman and with Mrs. Freeman, they are the people who are in a position of, they're not in a position of power. And yet the whole story is about how the people who are actually in power or think they're in power are being used and manipulated by the people they think that they are beneath them, mm-hmm. right? And so that's one of the points of the story is that both Mrs. Hopewell and Joy both think they hold some level of control over Mrs. Freeman and the Bible salesman, and yet at the end of the story, this is completely flipped on its head. And this is a theme with Flannery O'Connor. This is what happens in Greenleaf, right? Except uh, she does it to herself in that story. Right. She goes and she pursues her own destruction. And in this story, Holga keeps... Uh, what made me think of this is Holga has these moments. So this is playing off what you were saying, David. She has these moments where she is going to narrate the story and it's going to happen exactly like she thinks it's going to happen. She's going to have control over her feelings. She's going to seduce him. She's not going to be seduced by him. She's going to go off and she's going to make it happen exactly as she, this person with a PhD, this person who's incredibly refined and intelligent, <laughs> could make it happen, and she's going. She's going to have this level of control, and then it completely gets pulled out from under her by this person that she thought she was controlling. And I think that just trying to tease out this relationship again to go back to the earlier part of the conversation between the Bible salesman and Mrs. Freeman, mm-hmm. 
and why Mrs. Freeman might be given the last words of the story. I think it's the same. Um, Mrs. Hopewell thinks she has this level of control because she needs to have control over her life, and yet she has absolutely nothing. Right. Right. To echo one of the themes of the story, nothing. She has right. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting... We could talk about that one paragraph, that one page for a, a, an hour by itself if we wanted to. The one where you, she sees the science textbook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it, what does he, what does she say? It, uh, it works on her like an evil. Uh, I can't remember. An evil, uh, yeah, yeah. An worked evil on her like some evil incantation in, in gibberish. In gibberish, yeah. 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 She shut the book quickly and went out of the room as if she were having a chill. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so this is. I mean, Miss, uh, not Miss. I was about to say Mrs. O'Connor. Mm-hmm. Isn't that weird? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Flannery O'Connor, had definitely one of the numbers that she had for these Southern families. And I, being from Texas, it's still pretty prevalent. These families that feel like they have to have absolute control over every aspect of their life. And as soon as something comes in to interrupt this, they don't know how to deal with it. And so they keep trying to conceal and hide the fact that there is there are problems with their family. Mm. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's definitely one of the major themes of this story. Mrs. Hopewell does not want to deal with joy. She um, doesn't know what to do with her. And the Bible salesman then comes and sweeps her off her foot. <laughs> now, here's a sweeps her off her foot. Very nice. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, I think we would all agree, somebody stop me if we don't all agree, but I think we would all agree that the women in the story, they might be exaggerated. They might be grotesques to some degree. But they basically track psychologically. Is the Bible salesman supposed to be a character that tracks psychologically, or is he simply an instrument of fate? Is he just simply a symbol, an allegorical agent? It can, it, he, is he simply a what or an allegorical agent? A symbol, uh, like a symbol, or a is instrument of fate, or is he just here to? play a certain role and push everyone else forward or does he actually exist as a fully drawn character and in, in his own right uh, is that for me <laughs> that's for anybody oh i'm thinking yeah i'm thinking too here i mean this is a question it doesn't just apply to him it applies to all sorts of characters in her stories yeah the misfit it applies the same, to the misfit you know? o'connor didn't o'connor thought in terms of vocation and in terms of character I, that's my contention i don't think that she would have spent a lot of time thinking about does this character represent this? I think she's trying to tell a story that fulfills her, the vocation that she feels that she's led to. And then she thinks in terms of revealing that through characters. So I don't think that she would think in terms of that he's anything but a character. I don't think she would look at him as allegory. Um, mm-hmm. Now, whether she accomplished that, whether she drifts too far towards allegory without meaning to is now that, that may, that's a different conversation, I guess, but I don't think that she would say that, that he, that it's allegorical. I think for her, it's all about the character. I think that her themes are, her themes are not, they may not be buried, but they're revealed through character. And sure. so the character is the most important thing for her. So I think that she would see him as a character. I think that she would see, I think, she, I think, you know, I think if we're looking at the 1950s, you look at this drifter character, this sort of like hobo character, there's something sort of, if you strip away this particular scene and you don't look at him as like a criminal, there's something sort of romantic about that concept, right? Mm-hmm. The, the like mid century. Yep. World War II era sort of hobo drifter character. He's on his own. He's his own boss. He's like, there's something sort of fundamentally American about that sort of character. And she kind of takes that and then, she's, and then she kind of brings him as this agent of, of, of transformation fundamental, because he is fundamentally deceptive. Like for Flannery O'Connor, there's nothing more evil than being deceptively polite. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like that's the ulti- it's like the ultimate evil. And I think that the, he's a character that reveals that. I don't think that he, he's an allegory for it, though, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. But Jake maybe disagrees. Not really. I mean, I think that, you know, she's not as concerned about the character of the Bible salesman as she is about the, the women in the story, Joy and Mrs. Freeman and Mrs. Hopewell. And so you can't argue that, yeah, okay, she needs an agent of chaos to come in and or an agent of fate or an agent of providence or however she would frame it to cause the chaos necessary for the epiphanies to happen. But I don't, I don't disagree with anything that you've said, David. Talking about uh, uh, characters that track psychologically in O'Connor is sort of difficult because they all <laughs> are grotesques. And so they do, yeah. they, they, they track psychologically within the framework of the story, within the framework of um, the idea of grotesques. Mm-hmm. That, that was going to be my point. I was going to say that when I'm thinking about this sort of question, I'd, you can't forget that she was writing 
the Southern grotesque in that style. And uh, what that means is that certain things would be amplified and that there would be an element of un- uncanny unrealism, but also uncanny realism to it as well, both in both directions. And so the psychology tracks in the story. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's just an allegory, but obviously it's not realism in the sense that Tolstoy was writing realism right. either. Yeah. Right. So you're not going to run across a Flannery O'Connor character in a Tolstoy story. He would seem out of place. But in a Flannery O'Connor story, he's fine. And definitely is not reading like um, the Fairy Queen. Sure. Or something like that. <laughs> so, Although uh, I wouldn't mind just experimenting with a mashup on that. <laughs> hey, that would be fun. <laughs> Let me know if you do it. A fairy queen is hard to find. A fairy queen is hard to find. <laughs> yeah. A good fairy is hard to find. That's, good. that's a great, I, I like that question though. I think that's so easy to read O'Connor to, to, to instinctively drift towards like, what are the one-to-one correlations for what she's trying to do here? Like, mm-hmm. what does this represent? You know, it's sort of like a, like, is this some sort of medieval um, morality play know, morality play or yeah. something? Because mm-hmm. she's very, you can you can tell there's like there are certainly archetypes within her work that echoes those the sort of classical the sort of well maybe not ancient but the medieval and particularly the medieval Catholic writers. But then she also is working, as you said, in the sort of really truly American vein, and those two things come together in a pretty unique way in her in her work. Particularly, I think in her like middle and later work, some of her earlier stuff I think is maybe not quite as medieval. I think she became more medieval as she spent a lot of some more time communicating with monks. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That'll happen to you. <laughs> yeah, weird that. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun with these letters, seeing the different, uh, especially French mystics that she started to read and how those influenced her later in her life. And uh, I haven't read any of them. Many of, or many of them. I don't know if you guys have ever read any of the French mystics. Mm, no. Not so much. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting is where the char- what characters are her. Like, yeah. like, she, like this idea of knowing that you're not going to live very long, which, you know, maybe the, who knows how long either of those characters are actually going to live, but that was something that O'Connor herself actually lived with. So when, yeah. when that's something that you believe about yourself or you're aware of about yourself, how is that going to change you? I think that that's a, and then also the people around you, like, how did, does Miss Hopewell treat her, do- her daughter differently because of that belief, that reality? Mm. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. I don't think we're supposed to know for sure whether or not that's an, a proper diagnosis. I don't think it's an unfair diagnosis for the story, and I know that quite a few people have read it. That the leg, the uh, what's what word am I looking for? Prosthetic. The prosthetic leg. Thank you, man. My brain just skipped yeah. a beat there for a minute. <laughs> the prosthetic leg is supposed to be an outward manifestation of this thing that sets her apart, which is mm. her the fact that she's going to die young, and that there's this unique part of her that she both wants to hide, but also then takes some sort of pride in, and the way that people who have that in their life, deal with that sort of situation. And the Bible salesman knows exactly how to take advantage of that too. And take it away from her. And take it away from her, yeah. So I was just going to say, I think one of the things that defines that character of joy is Mm -hmm. self-contempt. There's that bit on, if you're in my collection, it's on 275, but where she says she had, she considered the name her personal affair. She had arrived at it first purely on the basis of its ugly sound and then the full genius of its fitness had struck her. She saw it as the name of her highest creative act. One of her major triumphs was that her mother had not been able to turn her dust into joy, but the greater one was that she had been able to turn herself, turn, been able to turn it herself into Holga. And she seems to have this deep rooted self contempt for herself, which I suspect has been passed on by other people around her. Um, and I think that's one of the great tragedies of the story is that Mrs. Hopewell doesn't actually, has not fed her daughter a sort of self-awareness that is any different than what Mrs. Freeman is offering her. So she won't look at her daughter, and, but that's not different than Mrs. Freeman looking at her as if she's some kind of weirdo, some, kind of, some sort of freak. And that has led her to feel about herself a sort of self-contempt, which is wrapped up in the leg. So I think in some ways, you could argue that the leg being taken from her, uh, well, grotesque, tear, she could be torn away from that self-contempt if you, you know, wanted to... Try to find the redemption. Yeah, be optimistic about things. Well, it's, I love it. I just want to ask the question. It's the the big question. Is there redemption in this story? I know we've kind of circled around this already, but is this story just a sick joke or is there redemption at the heart of it? I'm not talking about Flannery's output at large, just this story. Would this be a good time to read some of what she said about the story? Yeah, I think so. All right. Uh, This is a letter that I found pretty interesting. Um, Apparently this person wrote her saying that they had figured out what this story was about. So she said about... Good country people, let me say that you are not reading the story itself. Where do you get the idea that Holga's need to worship comes to flower in GCP? I 
I guess this is what this person thought was right. that, or that she had never had any faith at any time or never loved anybody before. None of these things are said in the story. So here's David to your point. She is full of contempt for the Bible salesman until she finds he is full of contempt for her. Nothing comes to flower here except her realization in the end that she ain't so smart. So that's how she reads the story. That's her epiphany at the end is that she ain't so smart. Um, and that would be kind of represented then by the leg being taken from her. She's had, having this thing pulled out from under her, literally. And the leg helps symbolize that. This thing that artificially holds her up. She says this, she mentions this, that my story screamed to you, uh, which echoes that essay we read. Now that Holga is repugnant to you only makes her more believable. I had a letter from a man who said Alan Tate was wrong about the story that Holga was not a maimed soul. She was just like us all. He ended the letter by saying he was in love with Holga. And he hoped someday she would learn to love him. Quaint. But I... St- <laughs> she's Quaint. funny. Yeah, she's pretty brutal. It shouldn't be surprising that she was that brutal, but she was. Man. But I stick neither with you nor with that gent here, but with Mr. Alan Tate. A maimed soul is a maimed soul. So that's how she sees Holga, is that there's something in particular about her that's missing. And then I sometimes thematic realizations come to me very slowly so obviously that's symbolized by the leg too that there's something literally missing from her Mm -hmm. her soul is maimed and it's echoed in the fact that her body is literally maimed Mm -hmm. with this leg that's missing so so then to the question is there redemption here if there's redemption it's in the fact that like o'connor says here that she sees that she ain't so smart and she's just left here hope helpless to have to deal with the fact that the fact of herself Mm -hmm. right the false thing that was propping her up has literally, quite literally, been taken away. And now, and this, now she's left with herself. Yeah. And to be honest, this guy who is. represents the real life manifestation of her philosophy yeah. has come to her. What she was aspiring to be, what yeah. she was trying to recreate herself as. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This guy, this thing that she was play acting towards, came here and exposed this raw nerve of what she was hiding. And maybe there is a chance then for redemption. For but her. we just don't know. It's left in yeah, the Yeah, we air. don't know. It's left there yeah. for us to wonder. At least she doesn't die. I mean, yeah. she lucked we, out as I mean, far as Flannery ha- O'Connor characters <laughs> Which go. Which very rarely happens in O'Connor, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we have to say that there's more, more hope for her at the end of this story than at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, right? That's right? So insofar as that's true, then yeah, there's there's at least hope for redemption by the end. And we know that Holga is, is O'Connor. So, I yeah. mean, she wrote herself into this one. Yeah. So by my count, there are 20... 20 I think it's like 22 plus, I got to like 22. So I'll just put it that way. 20, more than 22 references to vision and sight in this story. You, it even ta- it talks about how Holga is, her eyes were icy blue with the look of someone who has achieved blindness by an act of will and means to keep it. This is, I think this is a story about having our eyes open. I mean, you get the very first line. It's about being two-faced. It's about looking, you know, where, which way you're facing. Every character is constantly being, it's like the, the black eyes of the, um, of Mrs. Freeman, the eyes of the salesman. I mean, there's constant, these constant allusions to that. And so for me, if, if the, when it comes to redemption in this story, the question is for me, can seeing oneself, can seeing oneself for what you are be considered redemption? Can having your eyes opened to your own state, the reality of your own state be considered redemption? I think for O'Connor, a lot of the time it's about, it's not about, her stories are not always about like, what's the, rest of this person's life going to look like from this moment forward. But is this person in a position now where they have seen themselves truly to the point that they can repent? Mm -hmm. And it's because it's repentance. that's the beginning of, of that next step. And I think that in this story, I would say that there is redemption. I would say that it is hopeful because, because there is at least the capacity. Um, I think that all this irony and all this stuff going under the surface is leading to a capacity for, for the beginning of repentance. I don't think it's as clearly drawn as in some of her other stories. And I think there's a lot more left open. And I think that maybe it's a little more cynical back to that word than some of her other work. But I think that there is at least the possibility for, for repentance at the end of the story. I think that that is what might lead to the redemptive, the redemption in the story. At least Holga has a choice before her and she's seen the horrors of going the one direction. And she's been confronted with herself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the first step in repentance is being confronted with yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to point out that right before this happens, his, her glasses are also taken, right? So to go with this image, yeah. pointing out of sight. And she right. didn't realize he had taken her glasses, but this landscape could not seem exceptional to her for the seldom paid, for she seldom paid any close attention to her surroundings. So again, right before this is happening, before she's beginning to first be vulnerable for the first time in her life, and then as soon as she's vulnerable, 
having her being getting being betrayed by her vulnerability or by this person she was being vulnerable to that's going to leave her exposed and just aware of herself obviously yeah and so just this playing around with sight the fact that she can't see this this is taken away from her her leg is taken away from her she's left up there literally helpless she's not going to have any choice but to look for some sort of salvation or redemption mm-hmm. but physically yeah that's a great point it, that she's stuck there by herself She's not, I mean, it's pretty unlikely she's getting down by herself. One, she can't see, and two, she has, she only has one leg. So, <laughs> yeah. It, she's, and, it, you know, that's, I, when I was reading it, I was thinking, wait, why does he take her? Why does O'Connor have them go up into the, to the loft, um, as opposed to just somewhere else in the barn or anywhere else? And I think that the, the degree, it, it amplifies the, the tension, the drama. She's up that she's in a, bad spot when she's up there whereas if she'd been on the ground she could have at least crawled away there's no crawling away from the situation she's in now there's no escape the only way she gets down is if she gets help yeah she has to finally humble herself and ask for help one thing that she's never been willing to do of course and who knows about the other play, if you, yeah if you're playing with the uh parallels that are going on in the story then if she's asking for physical help that also means maybe she's asking finally for some other help as well you can at least hope yeah i don't know but then we cut to Two figures watching blithely and misunderstanding the whole thing. So that's true. I don't know. Yep. <laughs> she leaves us. <laughs> she likes to leave things fairly ambiguous. That Flannery. Why didn't she just tie it all up into a nice little bow? And then I wouldn't have to think about it or be bothered by it or ponder wouldn't that it. Wouldn't be nice, Nathan? <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't it be a better story if she did that? Well, why didn't she, she just write that? us essays about this? Why didn't she have to write yeah. a story in the so first just place? Tell <laughs> us what she thought. What's the point of literature? <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> and now we're now we're down to it. <laughs> Why do we do these podcasts? I, that's right. I don't know. We should probably just lock ourselves in a room and read the Bible. I, I really think that's what all Christians should do. Well, there is one thing that I think is really interesting that we didn't talk about, and that's what Mrs. Hopewell. Um, I think that for O'Connor, the, the, her stories were about, a, a large portion of her stories, I think, are about pointing out that our world, the world she lived in, and I think by extension, ours still, had had no knowledge of itself and it had no vision, um, at least for the right sort of things. And I think that for her, a lot of the time, she was help, trying to help point towards vision and point towards knowledge. And I, that's so when Jake mentioned, you know, what story should we talk about? My vote was for this one because I think that it gets to those themes very directly. I don't think mm-hmm. it's necessarily her best story. I, I'm not as fond though of this collection as i am for a second one if you're not going to talk about a good man it's hard to find which you could talk about so you're blue in the face but this i think is one of her better ones because it gets to the themes of what she's really all about um and i think part of related to that is this character of mrs hopewell and there's this there's the section we mentioned earlier where she's talking about the science and and this concept of nothing comes up a little bit before that there's a line where it's talking about how it's the second page where it talks about how she sees the world, the kind of things she likes to say. And it says, this is this amazing line that is dropped before that science passage comes up. And it just says, do you guys remember what her favorite saying is? Uh, what is it? Um, That's life. Well, right before that, yeah. Uh, Nothing is perfect. Nothing is perfect. Oh, right. Yeah. And I love the irony of Mrs. Hopewell. I mean, this is pure nihilism, essentially. If you look at it, if you want to kind of play with the language there, nothing is perfect. This was one of Mrs. Hopewell's favorite sayings. Another was, this is life. I mean, like this character named Mrs. Hopewell, that's basically pure nihilism, right? If you, that's basically the same thing as what Holga is saying. Mm-hmm. And the, the worldview that Holga is kind of adapting. Um, and I know that it's meant to be this sort of pithy saying that she says to get through life. But it's also a fundamentally like nihilistic way of nothing is life. That is life. That nothing is what life is. Uh, nothing is perfect. That's, I mean, I think that the way that O'Connor uses that and plays with it and drops it early in the story and then just that's the through line throughout the rest of the story. I, I think that's really, really amazing the, the way she does that. Okay, but I'm done. I'm done. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have any final thoughts. Any other yeah. further thoughts? I mean, I do, have, but nothing. So then, what are say. your final thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I have this random question that I've been sitting on this whole time, uh, and it might be the dumbest question ever. I'm not sure, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it, because we've got the great David Kern here, and he probably has some thoughts, and we've got Jake, we've got Brandon. Uh, Does Flannery O'Connor hate women? Uh, What? (laughs) (laughs) You're not... I thought you were going to say life, but <laughs> she <laughs> hate women. <laughs> first, you know, it just struck that, me in reading this first random. collection, at least. What's I that? think Flannery O'Connor hates herself. And she's a woman. <laughs> and I think that she likes to 
I mean, you know, it's it's easiest to draw what you know, right? So I just feel like this is this is just an informal theory I came up with that might be completely stupid and easily disprovable <laughs> instantly. But in just in thinking about it today, I was I just started to think about the different characters and her stories, and I was like, you know, the women are awful, oftentimes really awful grotesques and the men even the worst of them the misfit the gentleman that marries the deaf uh mute girl and then leaves her in the diner even this bible salesman has a certain humor and self-awareness to him that makes him almost in the context of this story likable or maybe i'm just perverse but it seems to me that a lot of the even awful male characters are more likable than the awful shrill hypocritical female characters in her stories that could be totally bogus. Just something I came up with, decided I'd throw it out there like a grenade and see what happened. Hmm. Well, that definitely was a grenade. Um, I think Hazel Moats is pretty unlikable, but that's in one of her novels. Yeah, I was thinking of Raber as well. He's pretty unlikable. But I, well, I was just going to say, I think that she probably was a pretty judgy observer mm-hmm. of the women in her community <laughs> and in her yeah. church community. And And I think also for her, she's not just criticizing like, She's not criticizing like nihilism and atheism at large. Like sh- she's criticizing the the church. She's criticizing what what Ralph Wood in his book about Flannery O'Connor called Christian atheism, like Christian nihilism. Like mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. Christian. You know, if you didn't, if it wasn't in First Baptist Church or whatever the cat her her Catholic parish was, you, you wouldn't necessarily know if if it didn't have like the Catholic mass tied to it and like the language that's been there for a century or for centuries, then you wouldn't necessarily know that it was something different than what everyone else is. And I think she's criticizing that. And so she's a pretty keen observer of that world. And in the South, particularly at that time, there's been some writing done on this in relation to her work. So much of the life of the church was driven by women. And I think that she's participating in that. I think she's being, I think she's definitely being critical and probably rightly judgy in some ways. Um, Mm -hmm. And maybe at times too harshly, but she's definitely being critical of the way those women were operating within the confines of the church and the way they were being fundamentally dishonest. And I don't think that she necessarily spares the men, but I think she sees and felt most keenly the way the women in those communities participated in the life of the church. And I think that she was bothered by that. And oppress um, the church and oppress the lives of everyone around them. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that in some ways, I, th- I think it's O'Connor that wrote this, that that there was a degree to which it was, man, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, that that there was a degree to which the women, Christian women in the churches of various denominations were the ones that most especially held on to the like pre-World War II way of life. That there was a way that they were holding on to even the prejudices that that drove slavery and Jim Crow and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. I I'm not an expert on that. That's something that I've read, but I think it's, you know, if you people want to people want to google that and prove me wrong or explore that further, it might be worth. Mm-hmm. That's out there. It's stuff that I've I've read, but again, that's only something I've I it's not like I've studied that. Um that's so I probably shouldn't have even said it, but it, you know. <laughs> no, it's 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 an interesting theory and it makes yeah. sense in the in the context of this story certainly. You have a male character that's obviously seen the horrors of modernism and fought in a war or two and yeah it's it's not striking me as something that she would never have said so (laughs) yeah there you go my theory is ask a dumb question and get a good answer and that's exactly what happened there so yeah um glad to be of service everyone (laughs) anything else anybody want to no this was fun yeah yeah thanks for having me on Hey, thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you to David Kern. Thank you also to Brandon and Jake. And uh, check out what they're doing over there at Close Reads, Forma, Cersei Institute. You can listen to a nice interview that Jake did with David. And yeah, go to patreon.com forward slash the booketing to support us. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Close Reads, if I'm not mistaken, to support them. We'll be back next week with something else, right, Brandon? That's right. Yay. All right. <laughs>